All right, episode three of the Forgotten Outdoors podcast. Uh, welcome. If you are tuning in for your first time, we are excited to have you here, and we hope that you will benefit from the conversation that we're going to have today. Today, we are talking about different hunting tactics. Um, ben, do you want to just kind of summarize what we mean by that? Yeah, so I think we might call this, this is, a, this is not an official title yet. <laughs> but we were talking about like approaching the unapproachable, you know, like how, how do you go out into the wilderness and even try to get on animals and get close enough and in a position where you could pull the trigger or release an arrow and actually harvest an animal. So, I mean, there's so many different tactics and I think a lot of it um, kind of depends on your terrain that you're in. It depends on what weapon you're using, kind of your gear. I think that dictates it a lot and, and probably honestly... For those of you that have hunted, probably how you grew up hunting, you know, yes. like probably what your dad or your grandpa did. Um, but but I think that a lot of you guys that are tuning into this, hopefully, uh, haven't might might not have gotten into hunting yet. So hopefully, we can give you um, kind of a list of a lot of different tactics and ways to approach different animals and get in position, and you can kind of choose around and depending on what you're using um, weapon wise you can figure out what's going to be best for you yeah and I think uh, something that's important to I guess make note of uh, is uh, at least for me spending uh, more time in the wild trying to hunt these animals you come to find out that these animals are actually very very intelligent they're not absolutely yeah. like I think sometimes we we think of you know the experiences we have with lazy dogs at home or lap dogs or cats even you know things that we are used to and we're used to being around and sometimes they can come off as unintelligent animals but these animals who have made the wild their home are very smart um and so i think that that's kind of what we're talking about when we say unapproachable yeah they you know they pick up on us very quickly they they know that you're there before you've even maybe seen an animal um they've already made or take a note that you've entered into their habitat. And so that's kind of what we're talking about by um, saying unapproachable. They are not used to you and they're yeah. smart and they will outsmart you if you don't find a different tactic to outsmart them first. Yeah, I like how you said that um, uh, they are, you're in their habitat. I mean, you're, you're stepping into their world when you're trying to hunt these animals. When you're in the elk woods, you are in their world. You're playing by their rules, and and they know their world a lot better than we do. Yeah, and we and we've mentioned this before. I mean, these animals know every stick. Yeah, that is on the forest ground. Yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing how quiet and how stealthy these animals can move because they literally know where every um, every time they take a step, they know where they're going. It's kind of for us as humans, it'd be turning off all the lights in your house. You'd be able to find your way around. Yeah. Um, even if it was pitch black and you were blindfolded, you'd kind of know where you're at. And I think for these animals, that's how it is. Yeah. It's like when you have to, you know, take a piss at like two o'clock in the morning and you don't want to flip the lights on to wake everybody up in the house and you can find your way without, you know, stubbing your toe. I think it's similar to that, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're just going to kind of get into it. We're going to talk about different ways that we've hunted before. Um, some we are more familiar with, some we're less familiar with. Um, in all of these or in all of our episodes, we always encourage you to reach out to us, uh, give us suggestions, give us advice. And as we're talking about these things, we'd love to hear some of your experiences with these different hunting tactics, what's worked for you, maybe what hasn't worked for you so that we can kind of share those learning experiences with all of our listeners. Yeah. And, and I guess another thing before we get into all these different tactics is with all of these, um, we're from southeastern Idaho, so yes. the state of Idaho. Um, you guys might be in Idaho. You might be in different states. But different states, just so you, you guys know, you might know this already, they have different stipulations and regulations, um, laws in place when it comes to hunting and how to approach that. And so uh, our experience with the fishing game, uh, sometimes they get a bad rap. But if you reach out to them and you're honestly trying to do what's right, um, and not try to be shady or do anything illegal. They've really, they've really um, helped us out a lot. You know, I've called the fishing game office, uh, the regional office. You know, five or six times they've been really helpful. So, so what I'm getting at is, just make sure that what you are trying to do, the the tactics that you're using are legal and they are authorized in your state. Yeah. Uh, they they post out the the fishing game guidelines, rules and regulations books. Uh, they put them out every year. 
Um, sometimes they put out like a second edition halfway through the year. Um, all that's online as well for I, uh, for us in Idaho. Um, but yeah, you can always give a phone call and just just make sure that you're doing this legally. Um, we don't we don't want to tell you that you can bait bears and 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 then in your state you you can't actually bait bears in because some states you can't and we don't want you to get in trouble. We want everybody to be law abiding citizens because when we're out in the woods, we're we're doing the very best that we can to play by the rules and play completely legally. Right. Yeah, so so with that, we're going to just kind of jump in um, to the first uh, tactic that we wanted to talk about, which is uh, spot and stock. So I feel like spot and stock is very common. Most, mm-hmm. if you've hunted, you know what this is. Um, essentially, what you're doing is you're spending a lot of time glassing. You're spending a lot of time behind some binoculars um, or behind a spotting scope, and you are looking for these animals um, up in the mountains. And once you've located them, then the stock begins where you are trying to get in close enough to if you're with a rifle if you're getting you're wanting to get within a certain range that you're comfortable to pull the trigger and obviously with um a bow you're having to get in much much closer um and so spot and stock uh for me is something that i've used fairly often it's not the only way that i hunt but i feel like i feel like spot and stock is kind of part of every hunt no matter what Yeah, that's kind of like the bread and butter, in, in my opinion. I mean, so even if you are, let's say, you know, what people call road hunting that gets a really bad rap uh, driving around and you see some animals two miles away, you're going to use this spot and stock method to yeah. go and get those animals killed. You're still getting out of the truck. Yeah, you're still getting out of the truck. So, yeah, spot and stock is kind of the bread and butter. That's what, you know, I definitely do the most of. You're on your feet a lot. It's a lot of hiking. Um, you're looking for a lot of sign, looking for tracks, looking for, you know, scat for those <laughs> scat. that don't like other words. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the official term. But yeah, you're, you're looking for sign. Um, you're getting up on a lot of ridges, glassing. Glassing, for the, those of you that might not know, is sitting behind glass. So binoculars, uh, spotting scopes. Uh, and you're looking at pockets of trees, hillsides, seeing any kind of movement. A lot of times it's early mornings, late at night. So that's when animals are moving around out into the open. You know, usually you get into the noon hours of the day when the sun's kind of high. And not very often will you see big game animals, elk, deer, um, those kind of critters. You won't often see them walking around in the open. Yeah. Uh, that's usually a early morning. They're kind of moving back to where they're going to go bed down. And late at night, they're coming out to feed. So those are the times that you're going to kind of want to get up in some good positions. Honestly, for us, when we usually go out and we kind of use this method, it is we hike up when it's freaking the butt crack of dawn. You know, it's, yep. it's, it's black. It's before hunting hours. And we want to be in position, I don't know, usually 30 minutes before legal hunting hours. So that we're sitting there. We're quiet. We let the world settle, and then you know, 30 minutes to an hour later, legal hunting hours, which in Idaho is 30 minutes before sunrise, pops up, and that that's that's what we've had the most luck with, and me personally, have had the most luck with. For sure, yeah. So, I, I guess just you know, quick story for me. So, um, Ben kind of mentioned how when you're road hunting, oftentimes that leads to a spot and stock. Um, this actually, this last year, I went on an elk hunt. Um, Ben actually came out with me one day, um, but it was a completely new unit, totally new area, never been there. Um, I drew an elk tag, and so... Uh, Can I cut in? Yeah, for sure. So for our listeners that don't know what like drawing a tag is, I know this might be really basic for some of you guys, but I know that a couple years ago I didn't really understand this concept. So there's over-the-counter tags, general tags that anyone can go buy if you have a hunting license. Um, and then there are draw tags uh, or controlled hunts, as they call them. And that is where, and states do it differently, but that's in Idaho. You pretty it's much. essentially a lottery. It's a lottery. You put in for a drawing, you pay like five, six bucks, whatever it is, and your name kind of goes into a hat, um, and they could possibly draw you out. And it's, you know, a select number of animals in a select area at a select time, and it's usually pretty good odds. So yeah, that's what Thomas drew on. He he drew on this really awesome elk hunt in this area that was far away, and we had never hunted yeah. it before. And and this place is, I mean, it's just desert, so it's very flat. Um, you can see for miles in any direction when you're out there. Big desert, big yeah. desert. So so me and Ben actually went out one day, 
Um, and we just drove roads because, like I said, I'd, I'd never been there. Ben had never been there. Yeah. This was new for both of us. So we went out. We drove roads. We looked for, um, you know, we were kind of hoping to maybe spot a herd of elk because it was time. It was the time of year where they should be herding up, uh, getting in big groups. And so we were kind of just driving, looking for that. Um, unfortunately, when me and Ben were out, we never saw a thing. I mean, we, we a saw, lot of antelope. Yeah, we, we saw <laughs> antelope, elk. but we didn't see any elk. So. What happened was I ended up going out um, again with another buddy. Uh, shout out to Sam who helped me find my elk. But we actually drove and it, we just kind of pulled over the truck and I was like, "Look, I am at a loss." And Sam's like, "Well, let's just walk. You know, let's just get out of the truck. Let's just walk." And sure enough, when we walked, because this was a desert, there was all these knolls and these hills and things that you, I mean, an entire herd of elk could be hiding behind one of these knows and you never know it yeah so this this point it's like midday so again kind of like what ben's saying not an ideal time to be looking for animals but we go over this knoll and sure enough there was a big old herd of elk and they're just bedded down they're basically taking it easy because it's hot and they're trying to stay cool so uh sam spots this herd um, and then end up putting on like a three and a half hour stock. So that's, so that's what we're talking about when we say spot and stock is, you know, we found the animals, but then getting close enough to shoot them. And mind you, I was even using a rifle. Um, but just, it's a slow process sometimes. Yeah. And we have the cuckoo clock going off <laughs> in the background. I forgot to shut that off. Yeah. And so like, it really depends on, you know, what, what weapon you're using, you know, so for like a rifle for Thomas, you know, like, and, and it depends on how confident you are. You're probably trying to get, you know, a couple hundred yards within probably 300 yards for yeah, a, a for good, sure. confident, solid shot. Yeah. And with a bow, archery, uh, I mean, you know, you're trying to close that in within probably 40 yards for a good, confident shot for, for most people. And so, yeah, that's, that's the trick. You know, you spot them out there and it's like, all right, how am I going to try to sneak up on these animals, put that stock on them? So that I'm in a position to kill them. And you have to take into account so many different things. So you have to take into account sound, the noise you're going to make, you know, crunching on sticks and grass and, and all that stuff. You have to take into account what's the wind doing, you know, like is, is the wind at your back blowing towards these animals? Because if you are, turn around and go home because, you know, <laughs> they're going to smell you and they're going to bust out of there. And so, yeah, and, and line of sight, you know, if they can see you, you need some kind of cover. Uh, defilade so that you can you know creep up on them without them seeing you so it's a fun game that I mean that's the kind of the bread and butter like Thomas was saying he was driving around and it turned into a spot and stock yep. and that's happened a lot of times for me even even you know even if you're like oh I'm not a road hunter I don't hunt out of a truck well you might be spotting and stalking in one area and you're like let's go try this other area it's a couple miles away you hop on the four-wheeler, you hop in the truck, and on your way, you see some animals yep. in your unit. It's like, all right, now now it's game on. Let's spot and stock from here. Yeah, for sure. And I think just kind of transitioning into our next tactic that we want to talk about, I think when you know, Ben's talking about archery hunting, having to get so close, sometimes it's just better not to even take a spot and stock route. Sometimes, right. um, you know, talking about our next tactic, it's better to just tree stand hunt. Mm -hmm. Um I have tree stand hunted with a rifle, but I would say the majority of the time people who are tree stand hunting are using a bow because I mean, essentially you're hoping the animal that you're hunting is going to walk within distance of your tree stand mm -hmm. and you're going to get a good shot off. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's, yeah, that's probably pretty accurate. You know, in this area, I would say, you know, most people that are using tree hat tree stands to hunt are using, you know, bows. And I guess, I don't know, I guess that depends on the animal as well, because, you know, for, for Thomas and, and for me as well, but your only um, experience tree stand hunting has been for bears, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, and for me, it was not only my first tree stand hunt, but it was also my first black bear hunt. And so I was a little bit uneasy anyway, just not super yeah. confident. So for me, I was like, I would rather have the firepower. Yeah. Then trust, put my trust into an arrow. Yeah. And I, and I think you like even going further than that, when you're hunting bears, usually you're not using a tree stand for the sake of getting close. I mean, it helps that you are getting close. You want to put your tree stand in a good, decent shooting distance. But I think more than that, you are, you're setting up a stationary location 
where you're planning the bears to come to, you know, right. so you, you're sitting up in a tree and the bears are going to come right to you. I think that's why people hunt at a tree stand so much is that, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot harder for the animals to smell you. It's a lot harder for them to see you or hear you when you're 20 feet up in a tree. They still can. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Yeah. They still can. And, and it puts you a little bit at ease that you're 20 feet up in a tree hunting bears. Although I have seen a bear climb a tree yes, and like I blinked and it was like at the top of a tree before, you know, how they say like a bear can climb a tree faster than it can run. I think that's true. It's pretty, it's pretty crazy. They're, they're a fun animal, but anyway, besides the point, yeah, tree sand hunting, it's, it's a different beast on it in its own. You know, we've, we've done it, um, with our bait that we use for, for bear hunting. I've, I've used it for whitetail hunting. Um, and kind of a reason behind that is, uh, one, I hunt them archery, um, and they're very, they're a very spooky animal. Um, and where I hunt whitetail and where most whitetail hang out, it's not a huge area. Usually it's fairly close to houses. Um, it's fairly close to civilization, usually river bottoms where there's a lot of dense brush. Um, it's not like 10 miles back into the back country, yeah. like elk hang out. So it's, you know, I hunt down on this one river, just in the river bottoms. Um, I can s- kind of see some tops of houses from my tree stand. And in Idaho, you can't bait. So it's not like a bear hunt where you can bait these deer in. A lot of places you can. Like my wife, she's from Oklahoma. Um, and she has family in Kansas as well. And they do a lot of deer hunting over there. Um, and I've gone and sat some tree stands in the mornings. And they, they can, they, everyone over there baits. You know, they have, they have food plots. They have corn feeders. Um, which is great, you know, and it it brings in some awesome bucks, but everyone else is competing with them. So, you know, it's just as challenging. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so what we're trying to do here is you try to, you set up a lot of trail cameras. Uh, those are motion sensor cameras out there that, you know, something walks by, it snaps a picture. And we do a ton of that, of moving cameras around, trying to figure out what's the pattern of these deer, what game trails are they usually going, and at what time of year are they going down these trails that I'm going to be sitting in the stand. And that's where we try to set up our stand. So it's not like they're coming into a bait like a bear would be, um, but that we are in shooting range and quiet as they walk down this game trail. Yeah, so essentially when you're hunting that way you're just looking for high traffic areas Mm -hmm. um you know and then you're basically just kind of keeping your fingers crossed that they just happen to be using that traffic area (laughs) when you're in your stand yeah And, and, and i guess there there are other scenarios where you would use a tree stand so um like some people i know that they elk hunt out of tree stands you know, if they find a good wallow, which yeah. is a big mud hole, bull elk during the rut season, their breeding season, they like to get down in that mud and they like to thrash around. They roll around, they kick it up on themselves, piss all over themselves. It's pretty cool to watch. So that they, yeah, they get in these these mud wallows and they just like to just make a mess. Um, and so I, I know people that set up tree stands by these mud wallows or by a spring or even on a high traffic area up in the backwoods. I've known people that. Um, and, and I've done this before too, they have a a tree stand up in some high country and they sit up there and during the rut for elk, they bugle, you know, they'll sit up there and they'll bugle elk in to them. And that's a, that's a tactic that works as well. So yeah, tree stands are another, another way to get yourself in a position to shoot some big game. And and it kind of goes hand in hand with another tactic uh, that people use and that's the blinds. Um, so you kind of have some different kinds of blinds. And it's a very it's very similar to tree stand hunting. You're just on the ground, so you have natural blinds where I know I've used a lot while I'm spotting and stalking. And you see an animal moving towards yeah. you, you grab a, a natural blind, so you hide behind some rocks or you hide behind a bush or kind of in a little a pocket of brambles or something like that, where the ground and nature itself is kind of creating a blind. You know, it's blocking you. It's that deflate. It's blocking you from view of the animal that's that's coming by. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, for me, I'm, I'm outside of what Ben just described, I don't really use blinds. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that they, like I've seen, I've watched a lot of videos on YouTube. I've watched a lot of um, other hunters use the pop-up blinds. That's basically yeah. just like, uh, if you've ever ice fished, it's basically a... It's a little tent. Yeah, it's like a fishing tent. But it just, you pull it um, open and then you're just sitting there. There's little windows where you can put your rifle out or your bow out and and you're just kind of again like ben said it's similar to the tree stand you're just hoping that 
these animals use these high traffic areas that, mm-hmm. you know, you happen to put your pop-up tent next to, and then you hopefully you're able to harvest the animal from there. Yeah. You know, they're a great option. You know, I haven't used them a ton, but I have used them. So certain areas, you know, let's, let's say we're on a whitetail hunt. Um, certain areas you ha- have these high traffic areas where you're like, man, I want a tree stand right there, but there's no trees big enough or tall enough or clear enough that I can set up a tree stand. You can throw up a blind, you know, at a water hole or on a high traffic area. I've seen people, um, which I haven't done yet. I, I haven't antelope hunted yet. Um, Thomas and I, we put in <laughs> yes. this year. So the draw tag that we're talking about controlled hunt, we put in for a, a antelope hunt this year. So cross your fingers for us in probably two weeks. We'll be able to see results and see if we drew on that. Uh, but, but anyways, yeah, I've seen people that set up these pop-up blinds, these little tents, camo, camouflage tents out on these water, water, <laughs> water holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and they sit in there and wait for animals to come in. Um, yeah, so I've, I've sat in them a couple times. I don't personally own one, but I have another buddy that I hunt with, um, and he has one and, and they're sweet. Yeah. Um, the the, kind of some of the downfalls or the cons to those is compared to a tree stand, you're more likely to be heard or smelled, um, cause you're not 20 feet up in a tree. Uh, you do usually have to set them up kind of beforehand in my experience. I feel like if you set them up for a couple days, those animals are going to be kind of weary. Even though it's camouflage and everything, they're going to notice something is new sitting there. And so it kind of gives them a little, you kind of need to give them a little time to get used to that. And I think that's kind of the same with tree stands as well. For sure. Uh, and, and another thing too, um, before we move on is um, kind of daylight hours too are, are a little hard in a blind because you are sitting in a tent. Um, yeah, you're like you're, the sun, once that sun starts going down, even though you might be able to hunt 30 minutes after sunset, you're only going to probably get about 10 minutes after sunset. And you're like, yeah, I can't, I can't see a thing. Yeah. Uh, we're going to call it. Yeah. So I think uh, noise is actually a really good thing for us to cover too. Cause, um, so Ben's talking about being in a blind on the ground. These animals have a potentially a better chance of hearing you just because you're, you're on that same, you're on the same level as them. And so they're going to be able to hear you. But, um, my experience with bear hunting in a tree stand, um, it was kind of interesting. Like I mentioned before, it was my first time hunting out of a tree stand. It was my first time hunting black bears. And so for me, I was, I mean, I really was kind of nervous. Like I was, uh, kind of jumpy my first time going. Well, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, especially your first time, it's kind of a, intimidating thing yeah. to be hunting an animal that could be hunting you. <laughs> right. Well, and, and that's the thing is like, honestly, up until that point, my experience with bears was reading news articles about grizzly bears attacking hunters in Island Park, which is like an hour from where we live. So for me, that's the image I had for bears is, okay, these things attack humans and, um, my experience now, and by doing a little bit more research, I have learned that, um, especially black bears, they are very skittish. Like they, yeah. they want nothing to do with you. So unless you um, make them feel threatened, chances are they're going to pretty much leave you alone. They're going to run away if you make noise. They just they're not going to come after you. That's not their first instinct. I feel like that's their instinct when they get afraid. Yeah, yeah, and, and just so that there's like. We don't want to scare anybody, but like black bears are usually very skittish. One thing to be wary of, though, with black bears is uh, mamas, like yes, sows with cubs. With, with cubs. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, that, that's kind of what changes um, bear, the black bears a little bit and their, their temperament and their attitude is when you have a sow with cubs, they're they're very dangerous. So do, do be careful. Don't think that all black bears are just fine and dandy, even though for 99% of the time, they are going to be more scared of you than you are of them. And I, I would say that that's for pretty much all hunting world. So yeah. <laughs> basically any any mom with little babies, uh, I feel like even in the human world, you, you hear about mom strength. So um, I think that that's a very real thing. But back to the noise topic. So for me, on my first time, I'm sitting in the blind or I'm sitting in the tree stand and Ben was sitting in the tree stand next to me 
And we're kind of sitting there. And when you're there and it's just dead quiet, you start to hear everything that's moving. I mean, like a squirrel would move and you'd be like, oh, is that a bear? You know, you like it, that's like your first thought. So, <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. there's tons of squirrels, especially where we were because we we were baiting. So we had all this food on the ground and things. And so squirrels, Bunch birds, of candy. Yeah. Um, everything. They're just coming to kind of check out our, our bait site as well. But I did... When, while we're sitting there, I hear some pretty big crashing behind me. Not like thrashing, but, you know, definitely something heavy, stepping on some sticks, coming through some bushes. Um, and so for me, I'm getting kind of nervous because it's behind me. I can't see it. Ben's tree stand isn't facing that way, so he can't see it. Um, and so I make a very sudden move to just turn and look. And in that second, all I could see was the back end of a bear. Yeah. And it's running away. So I think noise and sudden movements are just something to be aware of, no matter what kind of hunting you're doing. Um, you might think you're being pretty quiet even, but like we mentioned at the very beginning, these things, these animals are smart. Yeah. Um, and so those sudden movements that even that little bit of noise from you, your jacket rubbing against yourself while you're turning that, that could be the difference between harvesting and not harvesting an animal. Yeah. And just to clarify what Thomas means kind of by, sudden movements because I was there and I kind of saw this all unfold. Uh, I apologize to those that are just listening to this. It'll be a little bit harder, but those on the YouTube channel, they can see me. So like he wasn't like flailing his arms, you know, and like turning around really quick and making a lot of noise. Sudden movement was he was literally sitting here and he went like this. Yeah, just my head. Head like, turned. Kind of, like a nor not even a fast, but like a normal kind of Turn of the head, you know, kind of looking behind the tree to see what it was. Basically checking your blind spot in a car. Like, it, it, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, for those that are listening, that's that's literally what he did. Yeah, it's but, not. But you, it sent the bear running. Yeah, and it was gone. And we never saw that bear again. No. At least not in person. We caught a bunch of trail cam pics that we kind of... Assumed was the bear. Yeah, we it's ended a big up, bear. Yeah, and it was a nice-sized bear. And, yeah. and because of, you know, my inexperience and being it my first time, I kind of made a very rookie mistake making that sudden movement and and so we kind of lost out on the opportunity but it was a great learning experience for me i learned a ton from that yeah. um and and i love i love tree stand hunting i think yeah. it's i think it's a great time yeah yeah it's it's all it's like you're fighting human nature when you are are sitting there for four hours at a yeah, time sometimes and you're like you just hear squirrel after squirrel and then you hear something that's like Oh, I think that's an animal. That's bigger. And an animal that could kill me. <laughs> and it's right behind me. And the sun set about 10 minutes ago. I mean, it's almost every instinct in your body to turn around and see what the hell's moving behind you, you know? Yeah. So, so you kind of have to fight that. And, and I learned that a lot with, you know, whitetail hunting as well, because they're such a skittish animal that, man, if you hear something like that, you hear a stick snap, it's almost just best to just look forward. Yep. Don't, don't even wait. don't even don't even look because I mean you're not going to shoot behind the tree anyways you're not going to get a clear shot anyway so as as hard as it is sometimes and I won't lie sometimes I try to like out of my peripherals kind of you know sneak a look but yeah so so that's another challenge you know with tree stand hunting it's a fun way to hunt it's a very different way to hunt it's a very passive um way to hunt with a lot more preparation i i would think in some ways of you know setting it up and knowing where you're setting up and whether you're throwing a bait in there or knowing the high traffic areas and then it's a waiting game yeah you know and and and, and just so you guys know I, hopefully in future episodes we can do a whole episode on today we're going to talk about tree stand hunting or even more specific we're going to talk about tree stand hunting whitetail Right. Or we're going to talk about being in a tree stand for black bear. Or we're going to talk about spot and stock on Rocky Mountain Elk. You know, so hopefully we can do some more specific episodes. Today we're just kind of doing a big wash of kind of quick and down and dirty rundown of all these different um, hunting tactics. But but yeah, tree stand hunting, it's, it's it's kind of similar to that blind hunting. It's different than spot and stock, um, but it definitely has its pros. They, they all kind of have their pros and cons. Yeah, for and, sure. And I think that just so much of it is dictated by, like I said earlier, what are you? What weapon are you using? What kind of gear do you have? What animal are you hunting? And you know what is the terrain like? What what's the terrain dictate? You know, some some areas, 
you're not going to have an effective spot in stock because yeah. the brush is 10 feet tall and super thick and you're not going to be able to see anything and you're going to make a ton of noise. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I think what Ben said is, is a good point. We do want to dive in deeper to all of these topics. Um, we, we kind of touched on road hunting. I don't think we need to go into that a ton. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but you know, down the road, I think for sure we want to dive deeper into these things. And honestly, like we, like we kind of mentioned earlier, we, we do want your guys' thoughts. We want your opinions. Um, we want your suggestions, uh, because for us, we we're still learning some of these tactics. I mean, yeah, yeah, we've been doing them for a few years. Yeah. We've gotten, we've had some success stories. We've been able to harvest some animals using these tactics, uh, the best way that we know how, but there are people out there who know way more than we do. And so, and so we want to learn from those people. We want you to kind of reach out to us. Um, again, shameless plug. We're on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, look us up, find us, um, send us messages, send us an email, um, do whatever you got to do. Cause we, we'd love to hear from, from all of you. And we'd love to continue to learn and to, um, increase our knowledge and then be able to pass that on to people who are just getting into this. Yeah. And, and before we kind of wrap up this episode, cause I think we're kind of coming to the end of this one. Um, I, I just kind of want to clarify that this is a lot of these tactics are pretty much for big game. Um, they're, they're kind of big game tactics. So we're talking, you know, antelope, elk, deer, you know, muley, whitetails, bears, th- those kind of animals. Um, we're not even touching into a lot of the bird type hunting. Yep. You know, there's waterfowl hunting where it's kind of like blind hunting. You know, you set up, you set decoys. That's a different animal. Uh, there's upland bird hunting where, you know, you're beating brush and having bird dogs run out in front of you. So that, so this isn't the only way to hunt. This is, this is the major tactics used in most big game hunting, at least in the area and, that we're familiar and, with. and, and what we're familiar with. So yeah. just so that, that clarification, um, but yeah, um, now that we're coming to the end, Thomas said, hit us up, let us know questions. We will say it a million times. We're not the experts guys. Um, that's not discrediting the knowledge that we do have because we do have some experience and we do For have sure. had a, some success some really good success. We've learned a lot and we want to share that with you guys, but we have lots to learn still. Uh, we, we, every, everybody does. Um, hopefully in some future episodes coming up soon, we can get some of our so-called experts, you know, <laughs> on here that, that their thing is blind hunting and we're going to talk about blind hunting and they're going to teach us way more than we ever knew about blind hunting for an example. So, so hopefully we can get that going quick, but hit us up with your questions, hit us up with, um, even, even comments of, Oh yeah, we really like that. I would have wished you would have gone into this a little bit more, or how about you guys do an episode about this? Because we're not doing this podcast just to hear ourselves talk. Right. We want to have relevant information to give out to you guys uh, so that it's, that it's worth tuning in and listening to. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're up on a lot of different um, platforms. We're on our Facebook, Instagram, our, our um, this podcast is up on YouTube. What are the other ones? Spotify, Google play, Apple, Apple podcasts. Podcast. Yep. So, so yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to get out there. We're trying to get on all the main platforms so we can reach as many people as possible. Because again, we're trying to build confidence in the outdoors and we want people to get outside. We want people to find their own forgotten, uh, figure out what that means for you. And, um, ultimately hopefully spark interest in trying new things and getting outside. Yeah. And if you couldn't tell, like the last five minutes of that, we've really been just kind of been spinning the wheels, dragging it on, and we still haven't figured out a way to end wrap this. these up. And, and you know what? You know what, Tom? We we just might not. We might not find out a good way, and you're just going to be like surprised of every time of how we. we that's what's going to keep these. you listening to the end. That's right. Is to listen to how we wrap like, it up. How, how stupid are these guys going to be today? <laughs> how long are they going to drag me out before they finally give that stupid freaking clap? <laughs> and with that. Thank you for tuning in.